So welcome to uh, the respiratory system uh, section of this fantastic meeting. Thank you to the organisers, Sue, Mike and Hugh, for bringing together this fantastic collection of speakers throughout the first three days. I guess it's appropriate we start with the respiratory system, given what we know about uh, COVID and, and its pathogenesis. I do ask you to start thinking your questions now for the, this session, which finishes at the half past three. There'll be ample opportunity to talk to a number of experts who uh, I think we brought together. The first part of the session, we're going to focus on the evolution of the macrophysiology of COVID. We're very honored to have Luciana Gattioni, who has contributed so much to ARDS and critical care medicine. He's a clinician physiologist of, of um, huge standing. And Luciano will uh, begin this session talking about the evolution of the macrophysiology of COVID-19. And then following Luciano's session, we will have a, uh, uh, the grounding of the micropathogenesis of viral infection and pneumonitis from Claire Smith who's based at UCL as a non-clinical lecturer in respiratory pathophysiology. So once that session's finished, I'm gonna encourage you to think of even more questions, and then we will have a quick fire uh, summary from Ben Garfield, Laura Price, and Andrew Bentley on various aspects of COVID that I hope will fuel uh, some more physiological and clinical thoughts as to the importance of um, understanding the pathogenesis from the respiratory system. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Luciano Gattioni, who's based in the University of Gottingen currently. He's going to give us, give us a, an overview of the evolution of COVID-19 from the macrophysiological respiratory point of view. Thank you, Luciano. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here in the Physiological Society because I think that the still physiology is the basis of the clinical medicine. So I will give you my view without pretending that this is the truth. But this uh, is, uh, has been acquired uh, speaking uh, and working with a lot of the physicians uh, in uh, Italy and not only in Italy, also in the UK and other nations. So let me start uh, just to uh, to put in, in the right perspective, I think, for 50 years, uh, we are used to face and to deal with ARDS. So first was the adult respiratory distress syndrome, which became acute respiratory distress syndrome. And everybody know it was described the first time <clears throat> on 11 patients, only 2000 patients, on 11 patients in the 67 by Asbaug and Petty. And uh, you know, you have different etiology, pneumonia, sepsis, innovation, a different disease, uh, which at the end of the story uh, lead to edema formation. Edema formation, the edema still space to the gas. The gas space is reduced, we have the baby lung, and we have uh, three symptoms, main symptoms. One, which are related with the gas exchange, the other we are related with the lung mechanics. The RDS is described as a stiff lung, low respiratory system compliance, and other system about the hemodynamics. Usually the RDS is characterized by a hypertension, pulmonary hypertension. Now, this is the RDS and the CT scan allowed to describe that what appears diffuse here is uh, in a normal RDS uh, quite well defined. We have a part which is a black, non-dependent, and a part which is more collapsed or consolidated, which is independent now regions. And if you have the distribution of the pixels, the city numbers in a normal, in normal man, we see that most are uh, minus 700, means 70% gas, 30% tissue. This is the normal position of the lung. In RDS, we have something like this. So we call this small lung, we call it baby lung. 
And uh, this was a quite consistent finding over the last 40 years, 50, 30 years since we start to use the CT scan in this condition is, a, is a, um, classified as a ARDS. Just a second. Okay. So this is the baby lung. Now, when we start with the baby lung concept, we try to, uh, with the CT, we try to correlate the bad lung, that means the non aerated lung, with a lot of variables. And we did not find great relationship, but we found a very strict relationship between the normally aerated tissue and the C-start and the compliance at the beginning. And this has been confirmed also now. That means that the compliance in the lung is a function of the amount of gas that you have in the lung, being the specific elastance pretty constant around the 12 centimeter water, even in patient with RDS. And of course, having the baby lung here, we start to try to favor the perfusion. So we were putting the patient in prone position, expecting better perfusion of the baby lung. When we start to do CD scan in prone position, we found that in normal RDS, we have a migration of the densities from dependent. The, the density are always in the dependent part. But we have redistribution of densities in classical RDS. And this led to the sponge model. Okay, we have a lung which increases its own weight because of the edema. The most dependent part of the lung are compressed by the lung above. And this explains the action of PEEP, which keep open this one, but over this time, this one. And in part of the prone position, keeps this one open and close the anterior one. Now, then appear the COVID-19 related RDS. And having patients with hypoxemia and bilateral infiltrates, everybody community jumped on the ARDS concept. Because strictly speaking, COVID-19 at certain level, when a PF below 300, a very, very, very smooth criteria, is, uh, can be enrolled in the, under the RDS umbrella. And having this umbrella, RDS, the people start to treat at the beginning of the first wave the COVID-19 patient as ARDS. So looking at the tables, increasing PEEP, so it was not rare to have PEEP. The median PEEP in Lombardia during the first months was around 16. That means half of the patients were treated with more than 16 of PEEP. But when I start with Cumelo to look at the compliance of this patient, we found this was the first patient, but not only the patient treated and examined with CT scan, it was quite common experience of the people treating this patient then. The patient was severely hypoxemic, but they had a flexible lung, very soft lung to ventilate. And here we have about 50% of a compliance, greater than 50, 60, 70, 80, but, associated with a very severe right to left uh, venous admixture, modern chan function, according to the relay model. Now, in 40 years that they were playing with the RDS, I never saw a population with so high frequency of uh, high compliance when they arrive with criteria of the RDS. And uh, this is the Grasselli study on pathophysiology of COVID. 
the authors conclude that, well, Karts is a normal early hazard. But uh, look in the supplemental table as to COVID-19 RDS, 297 patients, 43 of compliance, 42, 40. Classical RDS, pneumonia subset, uh, 37, 31, 28. 12 centimeter of compliance is a huge amount. And when we start to look not only the compliance, but we start to the CT with the QML, and we see that at each level of the CT, that means close to the sternum, around the CT contour, down to the vertebra, at this stage, the ARDS, so-called ARDS, I prefer to call the COVID-19 pneumonia, the amount of gas is remarkably higher than during classical ARDS. And of course, as usually, the gas volume and compliance are quite well related. Exactly as in the baby lung. But in the baby lung, the gas volume is very low. Here, the gas volume is very high. Look here, we have all this lung volume, 200, 200 feet. All together, we have more than two liters, two liters and a half, some patients, three liters of gas volume and deep hypoxemia. I mean, to me, it's difficult to call this classical RDS, and I do not understand why many colleagues uh, were very upset about this, uh, this, uh, this finding, not this finding, this, uh, this proposal. So we, when we looked at the pneumonia, COVID pneumonia, and we matched the COVID pneumonia with a series of patients matching with the same PF, so very bad PF, one or six. So it's close to what we call a reversible hypoxemia. You see that the compliance in CARS is around 50. Here, if we match the patient with the same compliance, because even in normal RDS, some patients have a high compliance, but very rare. If we match the high compliance patient, they have a much better PO2 than the RDS, 150 of PF versus less than 100. So the other findings, we had severe hypoxemia, flexible lung, dissociation between CT appearance hypoxemia. With disease progression, the thing changed. So I think at the beginning, because the time play an absolute important role at the beginning, we start with the hypercoagulation, thrombosis, and so on, loss of vasomotor tone and the acute. Because when I was very little, I was teased that gas exchange in mathematics. And if I have the lung which is full of gas, the compliance is good, and hypoxemia is bad, we have only one explanation, which is called perfusion because gas exchange is a question of ventilation and perfusion. And if we look at the venous admixture in classical RDS matched with the PF of 106, you see that greater is the amount of non aerated tissue, as I expect, the venous admixture goes up because the basic mechanism of hypoxemia in classical RDS is the shunt perfusion of non aerated tissue. Here, if I mesh with the compliance, same story. But look at the COVID. At 20, 25, 50% of non aerated tissue, the minus admixture was around 50%. So independent of the anatomy of the lung. And uh, we will discuss, I think, later this one, but it's not what I don't want that. Uh, stuck here, but uh, has been progressively recognized uh, that uh, we have a lot of perfusion defects in uh, RDS. Now, how is possible that the same disease may present uh, in different reports, the compliance very high, the compliance is low, the compliance is almost normal, the compliance is 30, 
I think a lot, if not all, depends on the time of the observation. If you look at the COVID in early phase, intermediate phase, or late phase. Let me give you an example. This is a supine COVID five centimeter of water, prone five centimeter of water. You see, we have some density distribution, not much. Recruitment, that means opening of previous close uh, regions of the lung is a very marginal, about 8%. And this may be computed from supine at 35. So this is a recruitment CT. The PO2 went up 229, 233 here. Not great change. Here goes up. But look at intermediate COVID, supine 5. Look at his density. This looks really as classic as the S. I put in prone position, I have some opening, I have some jump in PO2, 104. I put in, super, in supine at 35, a recruitment. A recruitment is huge, 40%. So in this case, the pressure have an action which is completely different from the previous case. Now the time passing, look here. Look at this density, are very different from this, taken at same pressure, 5 of PIP, PO2 and PO2 80, extremely low, prone position, the density stayed there, means the nature of density changed. Here are prevalent consolidation, that means pulmonary units occupied, fibrotic process, lung structure, which is deeply changed, the density stay up, which is completely different from the observed in non-COVID non RDS. I observed maybe in my life once with a CT scan. Now, supine 35, look, recruitment, 1%, excuse me, 0.1%. Now, can you tell me what is the reason to put the PEEP here, the same PEEP as here or as here or as here? And if you look at the PO2, you follow these rules. It completely change the nature of the densities. And this is respiratory system compliance, but forget the compliance. Think to the amount of gas into the lung. Compliance and gas volume are not synonymous, but follows exactly the same trend. So the gas volume goes down, goes down with time, as you can see here. And the compliance goes down, goes down with time. PSO2 goes up. And the PSO is a, a clear signal of changes of the alveolar capillary structure, far more than PO2. The wet lung I may have is on, uh, maintain is on nature, it's just wet. But when the PCO2 start to rise with days, means I start with bubbles, blebs, thrombosis, rupture of, sepsi, of septal uh, barrier, and so on. Now, we will discuss a thing later. I don't want to spend time here in the hypoxemia, but the beginning, the patient doesn't feel any shortness of breath, because they receive, when they make some effort, receive exactly the amount of gas they expect. And the dysmea is a personal perception. If you go to 4,000 meters, a friend of mine climbing were telling me, oh, we had a saturation of 75, we didn't have any dysmea. Because dysmea start when you do not expect. We do not receive what you expect means that we have started to develop edema. So it's another stage of LTS. So we proposed uh, two phenotypes. My God, was a big scandal. I mean, phenotype for us was uh, just a term of uh, communication. If I call him a colleague, well, I have an L patient. I mean, the patient has low eye compliance, bad hypoxia, 
hypoxemia, the lung weight is pretty normal and recruitability is very low. Then if I call my same, and they say, okay, we have an age patient, means the compliance is reduced a lot. The mechanism of hypoxemia, we add the right to left shunt, the lung are heavy, and you may have high or lower recruitability. It depends if it's intermediate or late. And look here, look at the PO2, 95, 84. Look at the CT scan. And this was a friend of mine who died. Look at the CT distribution. This was treated because lack of beds in intensive care for seven days with spontaneous breathing. And I'm afraid that the spontaneous breathing if you have a deep inspiratory effort, you may induce, you add the damage to the natural cause of the disease. So type L, non-invasive support, but if effort persists, I would prevent silly. It's not early intubation or mechanical ventilation. It's the right time intubation. Early and late don't mean anything. Do not mean anything, in my opinion, having the therapy, the perfect therapy or respiratory support, the idea of respiratory support for COVID-19 pneumonia. It depends at which stage you receive the patients. And in type L, this was another scandal. Even six, more than six milliliters. My dear colleagues, in a lung like this, with six milliliters, if I have hypercarmia, tell me one good reason why not shoot seven or eight, which has been shown, never shown, deleterious compared to 10. We have at least three randomized studies about that. So if we swim in the, in the sea of the RDS, and we follow the tables derived from pathology, derived from other disease, we applied blindly to COVID. We may induce, I think, damages. What, what says as the PEEP here? The PEEP2 goes up, possibly, but because you are making problems with the perfusion, anytime we decrease the perfusion, the PEEP2 goes up. It's easier to oxygenate one liter than five liters of blood. This is known since the case. Proposition may increase the PO2, but doesn't have any protective effect against stress strain because stress strain here has extremely limited. Of course, if I have type H, you have the classical RDS. Nothing to discuss. But my question is, how much are the treatment contributing from L to H? Possibly. Remember that this disease in intensive care has a reported mortality going from 10 to 90%. Treatment may play a role. So that's live. It looks like it as Leonardo's lives. Let's see the, the Vitruvian man. Recruitability and atelectasis. Early RDS, very low. Then goes up in intermediate. The patient here are usually intensive care. Maybe they are receiving a lot of fluids. We have many, many possible confounding variables. But with time, the fibrosis wins. And recruitability disappear, atelectasis disappear. Prone position response completely different. Then we have PSU2 and consolidation goes, goes up with time. Compliance at gas volume goes down with time. Oxygenation is the same. And this, my dear colleagues, is a behavior that in a classical RDS I ever saw in my scientific life. Thank you for attention. Thank you.
So thank you for that, Luciana. That was a masterclass in physiology and perhaps a reminder that uh, we need to teach medical graduates physiology uh, over protocols. I'm now going to move on to introduce Claire Smith. So Claire is going to talk us through um, as a non-clinical lecturer in respiratory pathophysiology, how this all starts. So essentially the evolution of the micro pathophysiology of COVID. Thank you, Claire. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's difficult to follow Luciano's um, talk there, but um, yeah, my work is gonna very much focus on a very small area of the lung really, so that we can study the initiation of infection, what happens when we inhale this virus and it interacts with the airway epithelium. So I'm a virologist, um, studied um, epithelial biology for many years, and um, yeah, I'm gonna present some of my work for you today. As I say, we're focusing on a very small area of the lung, but as Luciano's nice talk showed, is that these very small interactions can have extraordinary consequences. And so, although we're just talking about something very small today, it, the implication of that interaction um, can be wide ranging. Um, so, a bit of virology, um, SARS-CoV-2 has been, from today, looked at the numbers, 72 million people worldwide have been infected with this virus, and it's led to more than 1.6 million deaths. The biggest risk factor that we've got so far is, is age. Uh, we know that people over 60 are five times more likely to die of, of, of COVID-19 compared to patients under 50. And again, higher if you're above 70, eight and a half times uh, greater risk. And this is, a, as I say, a very small virus. It's 500 times smaller than the width of human hair and very easily inhaled into, into the airway. And so, um, you know, considering it's around us all the time, why isn't everybody getting sick? Why don't we get sick all the time from these inhaled um, uh, uh, viruses and pathogens? And it's because we've got, we've developed some very good systems for being able to clear it before it even gets to our vulnerable tissue. And we have, you know, um, lots of different um, obstructions in the airway uh, that are on a macro scale. So we have, um, you know, small openings and hairs that help to trap as much as we can before they get to the vulnerable tissue. And this vulnerable tissue, is made, again, has its own defenses of um, microscopic hairs, motile cilia that help to kind of um, propel any pathogens away and also mucus that can help to stick and trap them, um, the pathogens if they do get in touch with these vulnerable uh, tissues. And this uh, ciliated epithelium is something that I've studied for many years. And I'm just going to show you some videos now of how effective this, uh, this epithelium is at propelling away uh, pathogens. So if we take um, a brushing of the airway and look at it directly under a microscope, then this is what we'll see. It's very, very fast ciliary beating um, and clearance happening. Sorry, it's not playing again. But, uh, very, um, they're beating at 16 times a second. So in order to really be able to uh, examine this in detail, we have to use uh, high speed video microscopy um, to be able to play this back in slow motion. So here we can see nice, this is the same video slowed down um, considerably, but you can see clearance going on of all these sort of red blood cells and bits of debris uh, going across the screen. So um, these cilia beat in this nice synchronous wave and any pathogens that can come in and damage this cell can disrupt this clearance and, and help um, pathogens to be able to um, invade neighboring cells and to, 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 to um, form a niche really in, in the airway. So um, disrupting this mucociliary escalator can have um, big consequences on our vulnerability to infection. So focusing now on um, SARS-CoV-2 and what we know so far. So here are some um, uh, sections from uh, autopsy lungs. That was, this was done by a group in um, UNC in America. Uh, and they took some um, H&E stains. So this is just where you're staining uh, to have a look at what cells are there and what quality the cells are in, in the lung. And we can see blood vessels um, here with the red blood cells in there and then these nice openings where we've got the airway and this is from someone who died of COVID-19 and just looking at how the virus is spread in, in the airway. 
And what's quite interesting about these is that we, we're actually seeing quite open airways here. There's not a lot of immune infiltrate what we've seen in other conditions, in other viral infections. So these airways, in this particular person anyway, were, um, didn't seem to have too much inflammatory uh, infiltrate. But we can see in here with the virus is stained in purple, that the, it, the virus does seem to be staying on the airway epithelium itself. So we can see it on the edges of these uh, open spaces of the airway particularly here. So it's, some, it, 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 it's appearing to be an epithelial disease, at least in the, um, in the initial stages of infection. And just to give you um, something to um, compare this to, I, I've studied RSV, so this is a respiratory syncytial viral infection. Um, I've studied that for many years. Uh, which is particularly um, severe in children. So it has this kind of opposite effect to SARS-CoV-2, where we see a worse outcome um, with RSV in, in, in children. Um, and here you can see, oh, this is a bit more zoomed in, but you can see uh, the um, a, an airway lumen here, which is full of um, immune cells. So, um, um, and if you were to wash these out with a BAL, um, we, we can find that they're predominantly made up of neutrophils. So in, in RSV infection anyway, we get a huge um, inflammatory infiltrate with immune cells. But in the previous autopsy uh, pictures, we're not, um, we're not seeing that level of infiltration, at least in that particular patient. So I'd say this is um, a, a disease that mostly affects the airway epithelium. Um, it uh, infects the cells by binding to ACE2 receptors on, on ciliated epithelial cells and some non-secretory um, uh, uh, airway epithelial cells and um, the adherence of the virus to the cells is, is aided by uh, this tempus 2 protease which cleaves the uh, ACE2, um, uh, cleaves the spike protein so that it can bind to the ACE2. So these two proteins, host proteins, are quite critical to actually getting the viral to infect and then once it gets into the cells it replicates and is released to go on to infect more cells. And again, this is the group from UNC. They've taken some airway brushings from people who died of, um, of SARS-CoV-2 infection and um, looking at what cell types are being infected by the virus and, and some beautiful pictures produced by this group. And here we can see um, a strip of airway epithelium. The virus is, is, is labeled in red and the cilia in this particular picture are labeled in, in green. And we can see that the, there seems to be a preference of these, um, the virus to infect the cells which are expressing cilia. So they it, um, replicate. So these are replicating in these um, cells which are expressing cilia. And if we look alternatively at, at the secretory cells, so these are cells which um, express mucus, for example. Um, here they've labelled those with green, and you can see that there doesn't seem to be that preference there. So the virus is infecting other cells, not the secretory cells. So it does seem to have this preference. And when they when they group it, or when they actually um, quantified this, you could see that there's a, a, an overwhelming um, majority of the cells that are infected are expressing alpha tubulin, which is a, a layer that makes up the cilia. So studying um, infection in these cells is, is, is very relevant to be able to understand how this disease starts, um, how the infection progresses, and then also if we were to start looking at interventions, antivirals, anti-inflammatories, we need a model which expresses these types of cells, which isn't that easy to come by. It's something we've worked on for many years, but it is a tricky method to establish. And just to give you a bit of background into, into how that um, model comes about, this is a very scaled down version of, of, our, of our model. But basically, we collect airway brushings from um, donors. So at the moment, we're, we're looking at at this age differential effect in in culture in um, in infection, so we're collecting uh, primary airway epithelial cells from children, adults, and the elderly um, to grow these in culture. So we expand them in in a co-culture with fibroblasts, which um, keeps their progenitor capacity a lot um, a lot better than standard culture methods, um, which means we can get a lot of cells. We can get a lot of the progenitor cells um, grown up. And, and then, then therefore seed multiple wells uh, to be able to do experiments on. So these wells are, um, as this image shows here, they were permeable. Um, uh, the, 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 uh, the plate is made up of a 24 well permeable support. So these are um, sort of plastic uh, 
yeah, inserts which have a porous membrane on them allows you to feed the cells on, you know, in on one direction. So in this case, we're feeding them basolaterally, and we see, and so these cells are seeded onto the underside of the uh, of the culture, and they're an air liquid interface. So we once they're exposed to the air, this um, promotes them to differentiate into the cells that you get in the airway. So we get our ciliated cells, our mucus producing cells, and our non ciliated, non secretory cells as well. And here's just a, an Im a video just showing our, um, of what our cultures look like. So you can see after 28 days, we have this kind of flickering appearance where the, we get a um, nice level of um, ciliation as well. So we can see that they're fully differentiated by measuring. Uh, how much cilia that we have in the um, in our cultures, and then this is a nice scanning electron microscopy image that I showed at the beginning, uh, just showing that our, um, how yeah the, the differentiated airway appeals that we get in our culture. Um, and so we've uh, we and others have started now looking at, to infect these cultures and characterize these cultures in regards to characteristics that are important for SARS-CoV-2 infection. So we've been doing some immunofluorescence microscopy, looking at ACE2 expression um, and where that is happening in relation to the ciliated cells. And this is an image that was um, created recently by my uh, new postdoc, uh, Max Woodall, who has been looking at ACE2 expression in our cultures. And we can see that it does seem to be a lot more uh, ACE2 expression on our ciliated cells. So if we co-stain for the tubulin, which is in the cilia, then we can see there's uh, quite a lot of co-localization going on between the two. So um, it could be the reason why we're getting this preferential infection of the ciliated cells in this model. And then this is uh, from another group who have looked at, um, at doing, done some similar work, uh, staining for, uh, and this is in this case, these cells have been infected with SARS-CoV-2. And we can see uh, this is the nuclear protein um, it's of the virus, which is red. And again, tubulin staining, and you can see there's quite a lot of co-localization between the two stains. So it looks like the virus, again, is targeting ciliated cells for infection. And these guys as well did a, a very long time course of this infection. We're looking at how much replicative virus was produced over a 30-day period in these cultures. Um, and seeing this kind of waveform of, 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 of the amount of virus. So initially, you get quite a high level of virus produced within the first three days. Then this seems to uh, be reduced and, and then go up again. And this, this is quite surprising. We don't really do this kind of length of, uh, of time course um, in these types of cultures before. Whether this is, is actually relevant in, 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 in vivo, we don't know because you would never really See this kind of effect with any, without any kind of um, immune cell involvement. So whether this is a natural phenomenon, but it's quite interesting. And this just explains how this method is done. So we, we collect um, supernatants or collect the airway epithelial cells, lyse them for, to collect as much vi live virus as we can, and then we were able to do this plaque assay. So if you've heard of, of, of the term plaque assay, this is what it is. You you grow um, confluent layers of um, of cells, in this case, Vero cells, which are monkey kidney cells, and just a, a nice cell line that gets infected with the um, with the virus. And then as the virus infects the cells, it infects the neighboring cells because um, you overlay it with this um, cellulose, which prevents it from infecting too far. And then you get areas of clearing where the virus has basically damaged all of the um, all of the cells in that area. So each of these holes originated from one virus. So we're able to um, count how many viruses we have and then this is this is how we get an idea of how much infectious virus we have in our cultures and then this is another image um, that was produced uh, quite early on in the in the pandemic of, of, of the ciliated cells producing the virus so you can see here lots of clusters of um, uh, virus on the cilia themselves this is some kind of mucus um, that's been or, or cell debris, but we can see lots of these nice little viral particles all around the cilia. So, so this could be affecting the mucociliary clearance as well if these cells are being damaged um, by the by the infection. So that's the very early stage. We know that these cells are being targeted by the virus, and we know that these virus and these cells are producing quite a lot of virus um, as well. So what happens next? So obviously um, we. Uh, when we get cells infected with a virus, they're not just going to be producing virus, they're going to be producing lots of um, immune signaling um, um, mediators to help 
attract some immune cells to them to help clear this virus. So um, we can see that we, um, we get um, immune cells flooding in from, from the um, vasculature into these um, airway spaces to help to um, either phagocytose the virus itself or help clear um, the virally infected cells. And we can get quite a lot of inflam inflammation happening as a consequence. And I just wanted to um, just draw your attention to this process in a bit more detail. So, um, so we, these uh, airway epithelial cells were producing lots of chemoattractants to, um, to attract these phagocytes or other lymphocytes um, from, from the vasculature. And this illustration just shows this quite well, how these cells squeeze through the um, endothelial cells and are attracted to sites of um, of damage, or in this case, there's a, a bacterial infection that um, that is needed to be cleared away, and so we get these nice concentration gradients occurring, um, drawing the the immune cells to the site where they need to be. And this is something which has been of interest to us in our research as ways of we can manipulate our model of the airway to to start to look at what happens when we get immune cell influx. And this is, uh, although we didn't see much evidence of it in that earlier um, autopsy sample, there is evidence of immune, uh, immune infiltration in SARS-CoV-2 infection. So here's um, some more um, post-mortem lung specimens um, showing um, thickening of the lung and neutrophilic inflammation, uh, which is shown uh, here by this arrow. So we're getting some neutrophils coming in, and um, it does seem to be causing some kind of um, cell damage, we're getting some apoptosis of endothelial cells as well going on. So this is um, showing that we, we are getting immune cell infiltration and this can help us to then start to unravel what might be going on in that systemic inflammation that we're seeing as well. So I'm just going to show you some further work that we've done with our model where we've been able to um, start to look to see what happens when you get immune cells um, Responding to viral infection, and so this is the kind. This is this is our model here, um, where we grow our epithelial cells again on the on the underside. They would have been fully differentiated at an air liquid interface, and then once we've infected uh, cells for about 72 hours. In this case, these, these cells are infected with RSV, but we're doing some work at the moment with SARS-CoV-2. Um, so these cells have been infected for three days, and then we can uh, find a nice healthy donor that we can take some blood from, purify the neutrophils using negative immune selection, uh, stain them with a, a fluorescent marker so that we can clearly see the neutrophils. And then on a microscope, we can watch as these um, immune cells uh, move across the airway epithelium in response to these chemokines and um, inflammatory mediators that are produced by these viral infected cells. And then we can uh, image this. So we can, we can take time-lapse microscopy to actually uh, monitor the movement of these neutrophils. And so this video that I'm gonna show you now is, is of this airway epithelium that we've imaged every 90 seconds for 45 minutes. And here in this, video, in this image here, you can see the black pores are um, shown kind of nicely here. You can see all the black pores around here. Our green is our virally infected cells. And then the neutrophils are these, are these red, um, the little red dots. So I'm just going to play this video. So you can see that the, the neutrophils um, squeeze through the membrane very quickly. I mean, within the first five to 10 minutes, really, we've got lots of neutrophils come through. And then they seem to... Um, move around and um, organize themselves in different ways. And I just want to draw your attention to particular neutrophil over here that likes to move all the way up there and, and form a nice little cluster up there. So they are moving with intent. Um, and we're now very interested to see what the impact of that does. So, so that's the first 45 minutes. After that time point, uh, we, we've done some analysis where we fix and stained and removed these neutrophil, uh, these, um, membranes for analysis and we can see that with RSV infection we get a lot more of these clusters of immune cells uh, of, of neutrophils sorry um, on the airway epithelium compared to a mock infected so um, the adherence of these neutrophils seems to be quite key and we get the overall about threefold more neutrophils coming through in response to RSV infection than we do with the mock. So what's the relevance of this? Well this we've shown is actually quite key because um, with RSV infection, anyway, once these neutrophils come in, we start to get removal 
of the virus. So the viral titer, as I've shown you with the plaque assay, we get less once these neutrophils are in the airway. So they are doing that job of, of, of clearing the infection. And this video that I'm going to show you here is, is, is just one particular cell that we found in our analysis. Again, the, the viral infected cells are, are shown in green and, and the neutrophils are in red. And you can see that uh, quite quickly, they, um, the neutrophils again are flooding into the system and uh, they keep bouncing around this viral infected cell until eventually it disappears. And again, this is within sort of 50 minutes of, um, of adding these neutrophils that uh, they're having this effect. So it's, um, yeah, they're doing important work and quite quickly and studying how they're able to do that and not damage the epithelial cells, um, I think will be a key, a key finding of what we can do. And so where we want to go with this, I think it's quite a new method. We really only published it at the beginning of this year, but we're, we're doing more and more work with it now. And one of the, the things that Lizzie Robinson, who's a PhD student who's just finished with us, um, she's focused a lot of her end of her PhD work on this, was to be able to track these neutrophils and how they're moving around and whether this kind of, I say, this organization of them is, is key. And um, we can find, we can look at them as, um, uh, you know, as, a, as a, a whole, as a collection of neutrophils, just how they're moving. We can see in our mock infected epithelium, we get much more kind of vertical movement. So it seems like they just come through the airway epithelium and then just drop off. Whereas with the RSV infected cells, they, they, uh, epithelial cells, they seem to, the neutrophils have much more purpose. They, they're moving across in a sort of horizontal way, like they're rolling across the epithelium um, with a bit more intent. And so studying that movement in more detail is what we're interested in. And we've picked out a couple of tracks here, which we think are really interesting. Um, so this is uh, showing uh, how a neutrophil is moving over time. We've got two neutrophils here that we've picked out. So we've got the pink line, which is a neutrophil that's come from the basolateral side. It's moved across the epithelium, and then it seems to just roll um, across the epithelium, stays on the epithelial layer. And then we've got this other one, this blue one that comes along, again, stays on the epithelial layer for a while, but then goes back up into the basolateral side. And this is really interesting because this could be some kind of uh, systemic signaling that we may be able to get out this model where we can say in this here we see a neutrophil coming we put these neutrophils onto the basal lateral side it comes across the epithelium and then returns and possibly back into circulation again which means that a neutrophil that may be coming into contact with the airway epithelial cells you've got SARS-CoV-2 infected epithelial cells um, and changing phenotype being activated by the virus or even phagocytosing the virus and transporting the virus to other parts of the body. And so this is, um, you know, obviously we, we know more and more about the impact of COVID-19 of, of, um, COVID in, in other organs and, um, you know, long COVID and um, how we can have cardiovascular issues and abdominal issues. And uh, one of the things that we're starting to think about in, with our work is whether the um, immune cells that are coming into contact with the uh, infected airway epithelium could be having an impact in other areas of the body as well. So something that may, you know, uh, neutrophil, for example, that becomes activated because of the virus could be returning to circulation and seeding and causing damage in other areas. So we think that this model that we've developed can be used to look at very early interventions antivirals, anti-inflammatories, but also maybe to be able to study some of the systemic mechanisms that might be um, happening with these uh, respiratory viral infections. So just to, to conclude, um, you know, we do more and more work to try and make our models as relevant to the human system as possible. And we think that they're necessary to study human viruses. There's been a lot of dependence on mouse models um, and yet we don't have any relevant antivirals yet so we want to focus instead on, on human mo human models to study human diseases to um, provide relevant understanding and develop relevant preclinical models for drug discovery and we think this is important to study the initiation of infection because this could help us to unravel the beginnings of the inflammatory cascade which is causing these uh, macro effects that um, Luciana was describing. And for particularly, we're interested in characterizing these neutrophil subtypes that we're getting um, and see whether we can help to predict the development of severe disease in some people. And so I just want to end by um, thanking lots of people who've been involved in this work over the years, in particular, Rod Smith, uh, Lizzie Robinson, Jenny Herbert, and Yu Deng, whose work I've 
presented here today. Um, and then I also want to thank the people who have helped keep me sane over the last few months with crazy working conditions that we've had to be under. Um, and that's uh, including lots of new staff that started with us. Um, Max Woodall, Katie Case, Teresa Mafunu, uh, Rob Hines, Marco Nikolic, Sam Ellis, Daniela Codinari, and Danny Lee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire, for that fantastic talk on helping us understand what's happening at the business end of uh, the virus. We're going to move swiftly on. I just encourage the audience to start thinking about the myriad of questions I'm sure you all have. Uh, we're going to move on now to um, Ben Garfield and Laura Price, who really bring a very specific clinical academic expertise into this respiratory session um, on uh, right ventricular dysfunction and pulmonary hypertension. Thank you, Laura and Ben. Okay, hi, absolutely huge thank you for the invitation. Um, and I, yeah, we, we're pulmonary vascular myself um, and intensive care. Ben, and we're going to do a joint approach. We've got a few slides. I'm going to whiz through, I promise, but there's a big topic. So really, this is a spectrum, um, leading on more, mostly from um, Gatlin and his incredible first talk, um, looking at the physiology. So we, we can see there's a spectrum of, of pulmonary vascular disease, and we can call the big P's macro thrombosis um, and microthrombosis, shown here using um, dual energy perfusion mapping from our institution showing that there's a microthrombosis, so almost PAH, pulmonary arterial hypertension, small vessel disease like mottling, black areas of, of absent perfusion. We can also see a mixed phenotype, and on the right is a normal, lovely red smooth map. Macrothrombosis is more common in, in COVID-19, and we've got masses of reasons why. I actually deleted that slide because I've got too many slides, but it's been shown in many, many um, cohorts. Um, it increases in prevalence as disease evolves, and maybe, and certainly, there's a DVT to PE transition. But there's also um, in situ thrombosis going on. It's worse in the sicker patients, it's associated with death, and it's more common than in other viral pneumonias, which already are, thro are, are very prothrombotic. So back to microthrombosis. This has been shown in several studies, several groups, looking using amazing and beautiful imaging modalities. I've shown you the red and black from our institution using dual energy. The purple one, purple is hypoperfusion. Um, and on the right, you can see a normal red lung. The red vessels are the small vessels in a normal healthy lung on, 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 on the right in the yellow one. The red vessels, so the micro vessels have been uh, obliterated. And the yellow are the medium-sized vessels, and they appear to be um, proliferative. So there's more of the medium-sized vessels. We'll come back to more of, that, more of that in a moment. So what's going on? There's a new um, radiological sign um, that's been described. You don't normally see the small vessels on a non-contrast CT scan going right to the edges of the lung. So something is filling up these vessels. We see this in tumor microemboli, a condition called PTTM, pulmonary tumor thrombotic microangiopathy. But in this condition, it's seen. And if you look at the non-contrast CTs carefully, there's a filling up. And is it immunothrombosis, a huge story of great importance, or both the dilatation of vessels? And we've mentioned that twice now. We know from this really key study um, in the New England in May by Ackerman and colleagues that endothelial cell injury is happening, probably not, although they express the ACE2 receptor, as we've just heard from um, Claire, that they probably don't directly infect cells, but they are um, affected and they're injured, and there's apoptosis which drives immunothrombosis. We see capillary microemboli on the pink vessel more so than, than the influenza already known to be very microthrombotic. So something is even more, even more so. And we, we, we see a microvascular occlusion. And this is just an illustration of the endothelial injury. There's that apoptosis slide again, the microthrombosis, um, and then the, the cellular infiltration with, with nets, with neutrophils and platelets, all coming together in, in the capillaries and causing an occlusion. Driven by this with an endotheliolitis, um, 
inflammatory cascades um, and an impacting on pulmonary vascular tone regulation. So the big question is, is there pulmonary hypertension in, in COVID ARDS? Well, we don't, we don't have studies measuring using PA catheters anymore. Um, we've seen some cases, certainly, but there may be a relation to the timing of measurement, certainly, likely, with the earlier phase probably lower tone, and then as, as the lungs become more fibrotic and stiff, higher, um, higher PA pressures. But it's probably mainly a bystander phenomenon. We definitely see some patients with right heart dysfunction, and Ben's going to talk about that in more detail. But this is just looking back, and it's an amazing replication of ARDS pathophysiology. We, we know microvascular disease and high dead space happened early on in pre-COVID ARDS. And actually, when we used to ventilate patients harder and with bigger tidal volumes, pulmonary hypertension was really common. And if you just look at this um, y-axis, these are the baseline mean PA pressure values of in the mid-30s, evolving over time. Sorry, these, these are the, the systolic PA pressures, but, 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 but the, the means were, were high. This is um, in a 1998 cohort. If you look back at the older cohorts by Warren Zapol and colleagues, the mean pressures were in the 30s. But this presence of pulmonary hypertension over time has reduced, but certainly throughout the illness, those who have worsening pressures do worse. And you can see the evolution over time. Um, I'm gonna whiz through this because I'm, I'm talking too much and Ben is nodding. This is interesting. Serotonin and nitric oxide prostacyclin and endothelin are implicated um, as vasomotor tone regulators, we think there's probably a, a reduction of hypoxic um, vasoconstriction, but this is really important. There is abnormal vasodilatation in early COVID patients, and we see this on imaging, the black and white image of the consolidated lung. If you look at the perfusion map, there's a hyperemic swollen area around the consolidated lung, suggesting abnormal dilatation. And that's been replicated in studies of patients where almost 80% of patients had, had bubbles coming through left to right shunting using transcranial Doppler studies. We can talk about that if needed. There's a new thing, a more neoangiogenesis, which is sprouting in the areas around the lung. And um, this is something we see in patients with marked lung hypoxia, pulmonary venoacoustic disease, interstitial lung disease. So there's some sort of protective mechanism. So as well as the pulmonary vasoconstriction, there seems to be a vessel dilatation going on at the, at the surface of the endothelium with all those factors you can, you can imagine um, and, and the white cell. So I, I suggest, and Ben and I talk about this a lot, we've, we've seen this high dead space. We suggest there's, a, there's both a low pulmonary vascular resistance and a high pulmonary vascular resistance phenotype and patients need to be individually assessed. Um, I'll leave that for now and we can always come back and I'll pass on to Ben, my colleague in the same room. Um, so again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk on uh, this very important subject. Um, and I'm just gonna briefly touch on right ventricular dysfunction in patients with COVID-19, um, particularly with our experience in the critical care unit here at the Brompton Hospital. So if we can all remember back, um, not that many months ago, um, but it feels like a lifetime ago to before COVID, um, we know that the prevalence of right ventricular dysfunction in ARDS is in the region of about 12.5% in modern studies since the advent of lung protective ventilation. And the causes are in the diagram on the right, but we can see microvascular occlusion, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, particularly important tidal volume and ventilation, but also in vasoactive mediators and possibly direct um, effects of acidosis and sepsis on myocardial function. The question has always been, from a right ventricular point of view at least, is whether this is a bystander effect or a target for intervention. And no particularly targeted therapy has ever been proven to alter outcomes when we're targeting the RV and ARDS. So is right ventricular dysfunction different in COVID-19? Um, there are a number of ECHO studies that have reported RV changes and pulmonary hypertension as the most common abnormality found and they certainly confer a poor prognosis. The prevalence is variable, um, and in the majority of studies, it's between 20 and 40%, um, but with a wide range, as you can see, between four and 72% in published work. And this is very dependent, I think, on whether the uh, study was done early or late in the disease course, 
um, as Professor Gattinoni has, has so eloquently um, described, um, the severity of the disease uh, with more severe um, dysfunction uh, occurring in more severely ill patients. Um, whether we describe radial longitudinal function, radial function seems to be more affected in these patients than longitudinal function, whether we're discussing dilation or dysfunction. So in severe disease and the patients that we deal with here at the Brompton, particularly um, those uh, requiring uh, extracorporeal support um, with ECMO, um, we think that the, as the disease progresses, the RV dysfunction and failure become more common. And in our very severe cohort, we actually found that the average fractional area change was only 28.9%, suggesting the majority of patients did have some form of RV dysfunction. Um, and you can see here in the diagram at the bottom in some work by uh, come from, from this institution by Bleakley, one of our, uh, Caroline Bleakley, one of our uh, cardiology consultants, um, has shown that if you take right ventricular fractional area change over TAPSI, there's a significant proportion more patients who have uh, right ventricular dysfunction and failure than uh, by radial function rather than longitudinal function. And there's been some uh, reports of hemodynamic collapse in the context of RV failure, both in the context of PE and, and without PE as well. Um, so this is just a, a brief video um, showing the uh, potential radial dysfunction in the right ventricle here. You can see this isn't um, really moving um, in a radial um, manner, this is the right ventricle. And here in influenza or ARDS in somebody with a normal RV function, you can see the dynamic action of the heart. So what are the causes um, of RDV dysfunction in COVID and are they different? Um, well, I think we've already gone through uh, the pulmonary vascular resistance story and certainly in clinical deteriorating patients, um, the only echo finding that's been noted is a reduction in pulmonary acceleration time suggesting an increase in PVR as the disease progresses. Um, Laura's already talked about the micro and macro thrombosis and the associations with raised D-dimer. Um, but going against the pulmonary uh, cause of the um, right ventricular dysfunction, there's this neoangiogenesis and lack of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. And it may be the imbalance between the two that causes a, um, a, a problem. And then is it a cardiac cause? Um, well, we know that the second most common abnormality after right heart dysfunction is um, LV diastolic dysfunction. These people tend to have stiff left ventricles with raised left atrial pressure, which may predispose them to high left ventricular filling pressures and therefore um, high pulmonary artery pressures because of that. Um, there's an association with raised troponin and BMP and there's a potential for subendocardial ischemia through coronary sinus congestion as the right ventricular dilates in these patients. Going against a primary cardiac cause and myocarditis is the fact that there's a normal, generally normal left ventricular ejection fraction in these patients. But in some follow-up studies um, by Puntman et al, they showed that in all comers, uh, recovery, uh, recovered uh, patients have a 70% of re recovered patients have some abnormality on their MRI, suggesting some myocarditis. And finally, just a note on treatment. We have treated some of these patients with either hypoxemia or RV dysfunction. And we found that nitric oxide responders were more likely to have a higher BMP, potentially uh, pointing to a cardiac involvement in these patients. And also in a few patients, we have also treated them with sildenafil because of profound RV failure or RV dysfunction. And they did increase their RV um, ejection fractions without a loss of uh, PF ratio or a reduction in PF ratio. So um, from our side, we just wanted to raise some points for discussion. Um, is the right ventricle dysfunction seen in COVID ARDS different from others? Is it a cardiomyopathy raised afterload or both? And does, as I think, maybe the balance shift between vasoplegia and vasoconstriction as the, uh, and thrombosis as the disease progresses through the various stages that have been eloquently described before? And um, are treatments warranted when they haven't been shown helpful in other causes of ARDS? Uh, thank you for your attention and your time. Uh, thanks, Ben and Laura. That was a fantastic insight into managing some of the clinical problems at the sharp end. Following on that theme, um, Andrew Bentley is now going to present uh, some work on supporting the respiratory system. I'd urge the audience to start thinking about your questions um, and we'll have 15 minutes after the, this uh, presentation from Andrew to consider some of the issues that have been raised in the last uh, hour or so. Thanks, Gareth. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for, uh, for inviting me and I uh, my couple of slides here are as a uh, 
humble respiratory physician and um, uh, uh, and intensivist. Uh, and I was um, really interested to listen to uh, Luciano's um, talk. One other aspect of my clinical role is a lead of a um, non long-term ventilation service. So I've been quite concerned seeing really the um, proliferation and the widespread use of CPAP and non-invasive ventilation um, devices in the uh, early stages of, um, of COVID-19. And clearly well aware that this is largely being driven by demands and pressures on intensive care um, services. But in relation to Luciano's talk, I think we really need to understand um, where those support strategies actually fit in. And just um, as a slightly lighthearted um, note, up in the Northwest, um, there was uh, widespread media uh, reporting on the successful use of uh, non-invasive ventilation um, devices, CPAP devices, and actually the use of adapted snorkel masks, which many of you um, uh, will have seen, saying that these were um, uh, saving, saving lives. So I think in line with what uh, Luciano was, uh, was saying, I think we really have to understand the, the impact on the um, clinico-physiological and pathological sort of features, because there's certain aspects of this where actually the use of these devices and certain aspects of the disease based on what you've been hearing from Laura and Ben as well in terms of the potential um, impact and progression of the, uh, the disease, but actually it could result in delayed intubation and ventilation and worsening um, outcomes from um, invasive ventilation. You've heard already, and, and, and I would agree with the, the others, that in the context of the, uh, the immediate sort of physiological um, response, we see certainly that patients do not express um, or have any sensation of symptomatic dyspnea. And there does appear to be at least a preserved compliance in relation to a worsening um, worsening PF ratio than we've actually seen with um, classical ARDS. This certainly does appear to be um, related, as you've already heard, to mechanisms of uh, impaired hypoxic uh, vasoconstriction and loss of reg regulatory tone, resulting in an increase in venous, uh, venous admixture uh, and uh, worsening VQ and left to right, uh, left to right shunting. Now, uh, in conjunction with this, as you've heard from Claire, we have the um, rather pro-inflammatory pro and uh, endothelial activation with the, the process of both micro and macro thrombosis, which um, can introduce, um, for example, microvascular clotting and an increase in, in dead space. The problem we have in this sort of situation that if, we, if we're not using CPAP or non-invasive ventilation devices, appropriately, we could then be actually worsening and causing more of a lung injury. One aspect you've heard is that these patients don't perceive their, their dyspnea and they, their response is, is with an increase in minute ventilation, which um, is largely manifest by an increase in, um, in tidal volume, thereby the non-invasive ventilation devices could well be exacerbating this process and actually causing causing harm. So I think we have to think about the process and the stages of the disease in terms of whether we're dealing with increased dead space and associated atelectasis with variable recrucibility versus issues in the, in the perhaps in the earlier stages of VQ mismatch. One observation I want to um, focus on is that it's important to be aware of the changing physiological and pathological patterns in the, in the disease, particularly in critical care. You saw some beautiful CT scans with progressive um, consolidation. But I just wanted to highlight, we've seen on a number of occasions, approximately two, two to three weeks in to an ICU stay, and we know that these patients stay a long time. Uh, and I was asked to review them, particularly from a failure to wean from mechanical ventilation. And as you've heard already, these patients have got deteriorating lung compliance. They'd initially stabilized, but had worsening and increasing oxygen requirements subsequently, and were running the risk of higher driving pressures on a ventilator. Uh, 
but these but the patient had negative microbiology from a non-directed lavage and inflammatory biomarkers were stable but what i want to highlight is that the ct scan showed increasing consolidation as you can actually see on the slide a there with uh, dense consolidation at the the bases with areas of bronchiectasis and traction bronchiectasis and lots of fibrous bands um, replacing um, uh, the ground glass opacification. Now, if you look at this, these sort of features are perhaps more in keeping, uh, not just with a progressive ARDS, but more in keeping with an organizing pneumonia. And I think it's really important to keep an to keep an open mind in the subsequent clinical deterioration of a patient in this in this setting. And there have been reports with these radiological features histopatho histopathologically of worse of in, in increasing mesochymal plugging of, al of alveoli. The reason for mentioning this is that the clinical relevance is that this may well respond to steroids, even if the patients have been on, for example, dexamethasone in the early stages of the disease. So I think really just to summarize and to try and tie up what we've been hearing so far and to raise some questions, I think there are some issues clearly that we've um, identified both physiologically, pathologically and clinically from the first wave. I think if we've heard from Luciano clearly that um, the priority is actually, particularly in the later phases of doing the basics of the ARDS management well, but there is an individual um, uh, strategy as well, particularly in relation to PEEP and perhaps the tolerance of slightly higher tidal volumes in the early stages. From Laura and, um, and, and Ben, obviously there's the issues that we've described there about the uh, immunothrombosis, and the, we need to. I think we need to learn more around the strategy for anticoagulation, which in a lot of our intensive care units is different, uh, and the impact that this will will have with other immunomodulatory um, modulatory strategies. I think with my long-term ventilation hat on, I think it's really important to understand more um, about the post-intensive care syndrome, uh, and we're yet to see whether the the long-term effects following COVID-19 ARDS cards compared to classic ARDS are indeed similar or whether there's different aspects which we have to focus on. And one of those that I, that I'm, um, that I would raise there is ongoing inflammation, particularly in, in muscle. And as you've heard in terms of the impact on the right heart and the long-term uh, consequences with respect to the lungs, I think the strategy for long-term follow-up follow up because there may well be different clinical phenotypes that we are left with and we've a lot more to learn from the long-term follow-up of COVID-19. So I'll, I'll leave it there and hope that's raised some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for giving us a clinical overview of um, the ventilatory support for these patients and the possible pros and cons. I'm going to invite the entire panel now to um, take the screen. Don't be shy. Equally, don't be shy if you have questions. You have approximately 10 minutes left to get more questions in. I'm going to unashamedly um, take the side of the physiologists for the first question. And this is directed to Claire, who looks rather shy at the moment, but she needs to appear on the screen. Um, Claire, there's a double strand to this question. By the way, everyone's got two lines to answer the questions. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Just focus on time. So in infected ciliated cells in the airway, what happens to the function of those cilia? Do they become deciliated or do they just beat less frequently or randomly? Question number one. Question number two, which I think is a fantastic uh, uh, thought, is are ciliated cells in other regions, such as the brain ventricles, the most important part of the body, um, also targeted in a similar way? So... First of all, what happens to their airway characteristics? Could it be happening to cilia elsewhere? Mm, no, good, good question. Thank you. Um, so in terms of ciliary function in regards to SARS-CoV-2 infection, I don't think there's been that much work on it yet. Uh, we've done some initial work here that, that implies that there is some effect on ciliary function, but we're, we're still working through that. So we don't know for sure yet. 
but we've done a lot of work with other viruses and RSV in particular, I think is quite an interesting example because um, with some viruses, you get a lot of destruction of the airway epithelium just by the virus itself, but RSV doesn't do that. It doesn't, on its own anyway, doesn't cause a lot of damage to the airway epithelium. It's quite subtle, um, but we do see ciliary dysfunction in that the cilia start to beat with a dyskinetic pattern. So. Some, in some examples, for example, you'll get ciliary loss, which will affect the mucociliary clearance. But with this, with RSV, we see that cells, the cilia are still beating. They're just not beating in that coordinated, synchronous way, wave form. So you would be getting disruption of that mucociliary clearance, but in a in a different kind of way. So we're looking at all different aspects of that with SARS-CoV-2. Um, the, the bigger challenge, I think, is that with SARS-CoV-2 anyway, it's in a category three lab. So we don't have our full, you know, um, set of equipment available to us. You know, this high speed video and all our fancy microscopes are not available to us. So that's the biggest challenge that we've had to overcome in these last few months is to try and get our, our CAT3 lab up, up to speed with what we normally do with our other viruses. So, so I think we will find something to do with ciliary function. I'd be very surprised if we don't, um, but I don't think it's, it's, it's not really definite. Yeah. Okay. Um, as for ciliated cells in other parts of the body, um, I don't think there's been any work done on the brain yet. Um, but we are seeing some work come out in, 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 in other areas. I think, I think I've seen some work on kidney cells. Um, so yeah, they that there there it does seem to be infection in other in other parts of the body, um, but whether how relevant that is, I don't know. You know, it's difficult. We see a lot with um, in models anyway. So you know, a lot of this work is done in um, in infection models. Okay. And when you when you for example, we've I've seen some work done with cardiomyocytes and you know other cells which are grown in culture where you can and and endothelial cells where you you do get infection in a culture situation, but how relevant that is in vivo, I don't know. You know how the virus gets to those places, um, I think is 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 yeah difficult to work out. I think we need more and more kind of autopsy sample we need to we need to see it of what's happening in people before we can see the relevance of these um, infection models because I think if you give a virus a cell and that's the only cell it can infect it's likely to infect it whereas if you've got lots of different cell types then you get preference to certain cell types and that's obviously more relevant in in, in the body so um, yeah I'm not, I'm not Thank sure you. Yeah. that's fantastic um, I'm going to move on to Ben and Laura, um, a, a very clinical bent to this question. This is the prize, by the way, for you asking Luciano your question. Um, and the question is, how do you account for the relatively low troponin levels if there is direct myocardial injury? So Anonymous question, I should say. I think it's, it's not, I mean, if it is ventricular ischemia, it's quite mild. Um, we're seeing it's not in everybody. I mean, this is really for Ben, actually. No, no, it's <laughs> like you're doing it. Working I mean, we, we see we're seeing the the sickest, the Brompton is seeing the sickest um, of all cohorts. I mean, in terms of the ECMO referrals and, and within the cohort here, this high prevalence of, of, of RV um, fractional areas or radial function dis disturbance. We we have a seen patients with severe RV dysfunction and they have high, high levels. Um, I do think it's mostly mild. That's uh, my observation, Ben. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the mild changes in troponin in the majority of patients that we're seeing, and those slight elevations are related to dilation and stretch rather than absolute necrosis of the tissue and inflammation. So I think that the, um, the stretch and damage in a, to a small extent with the right ventricular dilation that we're seeing is the predominant release cause for the release of troponin in these patients rather than absolute overt ischemia. I think that's probably yeah. explains it. And of course, if it's much higher, it would be a schema you'd be looking to exclude. Um, but we're also looking at BMP um, values has been very useful here, um, very much correlating with RV stretch and improving over time in patients whose RV functions have been getting better. Um, Fantastic. Um, so uh, not surprisingly, as, as Hugh Montgomery predicted, there are a lot of questions uh, coming in surrounding the concept of happy hypoxia. So I'm going to direct this to Luciano and Andrew. Um, 
And that is uh, essentially how do you explain those patients with very much affected lungs, yet who seem to be able to manage to breathe and function quite comfortably. Andrew, perhaps if you could start and then Luciano can follow. Your, your mute is on, Andrew. I seem to be making a habit of that, apologies. Um, yeah, I think clearly there is a, um, a wide discrepancy between the, um, perhaps the, the radiological, clinical radiological um, features and that um, sensation of, um, sensation of, uh, of, of dyspnea or, or the sensation that they actually feel relatively uh, asymptomatic. I think what we need to do to start with is actually clearly dissociate the um, the features that you see with relation to tachypnea in terms of a respiratory rate and separating that from a sensation of dyspnea. If you look at that sensation of dyspnea, that obviously has an element of central, central control as well. I think a lot of the profound um, changes that you're seeing, as I mentioned earlier, can be related to the um, loss of pulmonary vasoregulation and the, the associated pulmonary um, vasodilatation. I suppose one of the other features that we need to tie in actually, particularly with some of the more central effects and the impact of potentially the virus even on the brainstem as well, in terms of the, um, the ability for oxygen um, sensing. There's been some theories around that this may actually be related also to the, those patients that have lost, of, uh, lost, a, lost a sense of smell in terms of the impact in terms of the uh, innovation and the afferents um, to the um, peripheral and central chemoreceptors as well. So there may actually be an associated impaired feedback loop there as well, which may be impairing the sensation or delaying that sensation of dyspnea. Luciano? Your mute, your mute function is on. Uh, well, uh, I think that uh, um, for a patient presenting in an emergency room, no? We had uh, just one study submitted at the moment, quite rough, about 500 patients, 25%, approximately 25% of the patient had uh, a uh, saturation around 91, 92, so we're hypoxemic, uh, and I didn't mention any dyspnea, so 30%. And dyspnea, how was assessed? The problem is how to assess. I think that this, this may, if you ask the patient, uh, do you breathe okay, your breath is okay, the answer is no, some other patient either. In this patient, the respiratory frequency is around 21, 22, not a very high. I think that this may start when uh, the patient, uh, the compliance starts to go down or when you have uh, some uh, more space occupied by edema in, into the lung. So when you try to breathe and you don't receive what you expect, I think this is a sensation of this near. And the only explanation you have when you have the gas, the lung full of gas, and 90 or 80, 70, 60 of PO2 has to do something with the perfusion. And the perfusion dysregulation, I know maybe vasodilatation on one side, vasoconstriction in another side. So it's a very complex argument, but I think there is not a real precise rule. I think we should be able to look at this, uh, at this disease uh, as a composite puzzle. In some patient, uh, you have predominant vasoconstriction in other vasodilatation and also the the heart effects uh, on the right heart uh, depends on this kind of interaction at the end of the story. Plus uh, the therapy. I think when we start with therapy, we introduce uh, an important variables. And we may ask ourselves if the helmet CPAP used largely in Italy because our Pavlovian reflex is if you have 90 of PO2, you have to jump on the patient and correct hypoxemia. I'm wondering sometimes if this is the correct, is the, is the correct aptitude. Imagine a patient 
to be a patient together with other patients with this mask or with a helmet with a terrible noisy and maybe they don't have any sign of consequence hypoxemia. Remember, this patient usually comes with a normal hemoglobin, sometimes very high cardiac output. In intensive care, we had hemoglobin usually is around 10. That means one third of the oxygen transport is gone. But there is nothing to do with the hero jump on the patient to correct the PO2. And the PO2 is corrected. 95% of the case is not a problem. The PCO2 is very, very often ignored. And we forget that all the mechanical ventilation is a substitute for ventilation for the respiratory muscles, not for alveolar capillary membrane exchange. But there is nothing to do. This is the way we follow it. So, uh, so everyone needs to go back and read uh, John Widdicombe's work on stretch receptors, perhaps just to refresh the physiology of uh, dyspnea. Um, uh, this is a very clinical question coming up. So apologies, Claire. Um, the, a, a practical question. I see lots of people who don't feel dyspneic, but will have low oxygen saturations. How should we monitor these patients? And when should they be admitted to hospital? Do we have any feel for that from a clinical perspective on, on, on what would be sensible advice? Laura and Ben, perhaps, and Andrew. Um, sorry, carry on. Mm -hmm. oh, so we, we um, in Brompton obviously have a quaternary referral center, so we, we don't see those people coming through the front door um, but my understanding from a lot of my colleagues who were then making ECMO referrals later on on these patients was that if the SATs were less than 94%, they were being admitted to hospital for uh, monitoring. And I know some colleagues uh, in some parts of the world, in some parts of the UK, were sending people home with SATs monitors um, and if saying if they dropped to less than 92, you should come back. Um, so I think that's a cutoff. Um, clearly, um, intervention in these patients um, is complex and when to intervene is still I think not not clear um, and you know even from now we're in this kind of second wave when to initiate ECMO in these patients um, from our point of view is still a challenge because are we doing it too late once that fibrotic um, lung process has already um, supervened and then um, already the damage is done. Andrew uh Quick one-liner to wrap up the session. Yeah, um, very, very similar. Less than less than ninety-four seems to be our um, uh, uh, cut off in in that situation. Um, on the whole, just to add on top of what Ben was just saying, actually, that there are various um, tool predictors that clinicians, you know, it has been proposed. Uh, and various publications out there showing that in certain situations, CURB 65, News 2, National Early Warning Scores may, may help to support in terms of predicting those at, uh, at adverse, uh, adverse outcome. One thing I do want to make a point about, again, which is raising what Luciano is saying about the use of CPAP and the use of NIV, my feeling is that that should really be considered as a trial. And if there isn't there an improvement uh, in relation to what we've been talking about there within the first few hours, there needs to then be the decision in terms of the appropriate escalation of care. Because I think one of the take home messages here is that if we're not careful, uh, we could be potentially worsening, uh, uh, worsening outcomes if we dwell too long on it. So that's a, that's a fantastic way to end the session. I just want to thank everybody. We are running into the renal session. Uh, we could have talked all day. We could have talked for the next three days. Thank you very much. Hopefully that set the scene for a the rest of a fantastically organized conference. Thank you.